I'm going to talk to you a bit about my experience as a qualitative researcher on a very interdisciplinary project. And I think we're all aware that impact is increasingly on the agenda of funding, funding bodies and institutions and we're all being really encouraged to collaborate, all work together. But there's very little research that's really looked at the realities of this kind of work and in particular what does it mean for qualitative research and the qualitative researcher. So I want to share a bit about my experience and what I think we can learn from it. <coughs> so to give you a bit of background, um, the research that I'm going to talk about was my PhD research, which was situated within a larger interdisciplinary project um, that was funded by UK Research Council. And the point of the project, or the aim of the project, was to develop um, use nanotechnology to develop a point of care test that would be used for, developing, um, used for detecting viral infections in renal patients. And the project drew together a diverse interdisciplinary team to achieve this, so spanning um, engineering, chemistry, biochemistry, medicine and sociology. And the social sciences element of it was included as a stipulation of the research funders and it was constructed as a PhD that had the aims of exploring paths into use. So basically that means doing qualitative research with the people um, who would likely, would be, we were intended to use this device and trying to work out if, it, if this was going to come into use, how would it need to function, what would it need to do, what would it need to look like to fit within those settings and then feed this information into the design of the technology. Um, so that's what we were doing. Um, oh sorry, I've missed a bit. What I was going to say is that using this qualitative research in the design of the device necessitates collaborative working across the disciplines. We all needed to work together. So part of the focus of my research was on interdisciplinarity and trying to understand what makes it work. So just to um, draw very briefly on my methodology, I used actor network theory, which you may or may not be familiar with, to, to understand the dynamics of interdisciplinarity. And this really allowed me to look at um, the different actors within the research project and try and understand their effect on the nature of the collaboration and then subsequently the design of the technology. <coughs> so I applied this doing interviews with the members of the team and um, part of throughout the project and um, observations at team meetings. Uh, but because of the nature of the project, I could only really understand interdisciplinarity through my own experiences as part of that team. So in this sense, this part of my research um, used an autobiographical approach. And there's lots of advantages of using autobiography, and in particular, it gave me access to data that I wouldn't have been able to get access to as an outsider. I could see things that just wouldn't be visible to an outsider. But it also raised a couple of ethical challenges as well. So I think the, the most prominent one for me was in obtaining informed consent. So although I consented all of the participants and all of the, um, the rest of the research team into the project, my interactions with them, with them were framed by my position as a colleague rather than a researcher and therefore my research agenda wasn't as prominent within these interactions as it would have been in a, norm, in a traditional researcher participant interaction. So although I had their consent, I, was never true, I could never truly be sure just how informed that consent was. And this, was th this issue was more important because of the difficulties that I would have in maintaining confidentiality of the research team as well as the participants as well. So although I have anonymised the data so I can be confident that I can maintain confidentiality in, a, in, a wider, in the wider community. Because it's such a, a small research team, individuals are always going to be identifiable to each other just through the, through the quotes that I use, through the words that they say and the subjects that they're talking about. Um, so to deal with this, once I'd analysed my data and decided which quotes I wanted to use, I saw explicit consent from each team member to use the specific quote. So everything you see up here has been approved. <coughs> so obviously I haven't got time to talk about all my findings and everything that I know about what makes interdisciplinarity work or not work. But what I 
want to focus on today is just is one really important aspect and that's the framing of a project and the impact that this has on the nature of the collaboration. So framing refers to the process of deciding or of establishing what the project is and isn't concerned with. And um, Noor Satina talks of, the of framing as the design strategy for knowledge production, which I quite like. And she says that um, the framing at the beginning of a project is, re is particularly important. So in the original funding proposal, which I, I suppose you could see as the beginning of the project, the project was framed as around the development of an applied technology that would be used in a healthcare setting to detect viruses in a particular patient group. But this didn't remain a fixed goal for, for the project and there's lots of reasons why this goal slipped and, and different things came, um, came in. But I think one of the really important things for me was the position of the funding body in this. So, Although the project had been successful in gaining funding, the funding was actually delivered in two stages. So to qualify for the second round of funding, the projects needed, needed to demonstrate progress. And this really meant technical progress. So very early on, um, the project became framed around the nanotechnology, the nanoconductor itself. It became what Noor Satina refers to as the centering object. And the work of the project was then focused on what it would take to, to transform this nanoconductor into a working prototype of a biosensor. And this, so this, narrow, this narrowing of the framing onto the technical aspects was really bad news for me and my research because it essentially pushed the qualitative research completely outside of what was relevant within the project at all. Because when you're thinking about we're trying to work out how do you develop a prototype of a biosensor. Well, what's qualitative research with loads of people in the field who may or may not use it in five years' time going to tell you about how to make a prototype? Not very much at all. And um, this is quite nicely illustrated um, here in this quote by Lisa. Um, so Lisa is basically saying, you know, we just need to focus on the technical aspects first and then we'll think about how we implement it later. So it's very much you know, you're not needed quite now. Um, so, <laughs> so this wasn't a particularly good start to the project from my perspective at least. But the good news is that framing doesn't occur as a discrete event at the beginning of a project, but it's continually negotiated and renegotiated um, throughout its duration. So I just want to focus on a little bit on how it actually is that the that projects are framed and reframed. And I think it's quite useful to compare the positions of chemistry and sociology it, within this project and how they change through, throughout the course of it. Because for me, this really illustrates um, the fragility of shared spaces and... Um, did I just say that it's in the shared spaces? I'm not sure. I can't remember if I said that. Basically, it's all, the framing's all in shared spaces. So let's look at how chemistry and sociology established shared spaces and how that affected their position on the team. So because the project was now framed around developing the technology and specifically around the nanoconductor, this really privileged the position of the engineers on the project because the engineers themselves had developed the nanoconductor, so they controlled it. So the, the project was really constructed as an endeavour of engineering that would be assisted by collaboration with other disciplines. So it was really by establishing shared, shared spaces with the engineers that you could negotiate the framing of the project. So from the beginning, um, the chemistry team had really very good relations with the engineers. Um, the chemistry was led by Neil and their job was to develop a, pr um, a functionalization process for the nanoconductor. So basically, they had to work out how do you attach 
antibodies onto the surface of the nanoconductor and then these antibodies would then be used to detect specific proteins in blood samples. So that's what that means. Um, so the nanoconductor was really central to both the work of the chemists and the engineers and their relations to this material provided that shared space that they needed to collaborate. So they all started off quite happily. Um, and very, very quickly, the chemists developed a manual system for functionalising the nanoconductor. And this, this was fine for the purpose, for sort of a quick solution. But a functioning prototype was going to need an um, automated system. So at this point, the chemists handed over the manual functionalisation process to the engineers, and they used that to work on, to develop other parts of the system while at the same time the chemists then started to work on developing um, a more stable automated system for the prototype. And that, that's where their troubles began really, <laughs> because um, although Neil had, lo had lots of experience in functionalisation um, chemistry and that's why he'd been selected to join the project, the nanoconductor itself was made from a substance called graphene and Neil had never worked with graphene before. And he discovered that the controlling all the relationships between the different elements involved in the functionalisation process, including the graphene, the antibodies, the um, chemistry processes, the electronics, these were all just too difficult, too fragile to stabilise within the confines of this project and ultimately it was just too difficult for them to develop this automated system. And so reflecting on the, pro the progress of um, the chemistry at the end of the project, Neil really felt that it was down to the instability of the failure, sorry, it was down to the in instability of graphene um, as a material. So you know, he said he didn't realise how difficult graphene was going to be to work with, um, it's horrible, filthy, dirty, and it's great for the engineers because they can do lots of chemistry with it, but if you want to do involve biology, then it's more tricky. Neil's description of graphene is really interesting here because I think this really demonstrates the multiplicity of the material. So in relation to, for the engineers, graphene's brilliant. It's, it's really robust, you can do anything with it, and it's really easy to manipulate. But in relation to the work that the chemistry team were trying to do, it's a very fragile substance and it's very unstable and it caused unlimited problems for them. So with these different relations to graphene, at this point the, team, the, te the two teams lost that shared space that they had, they lost the nanoconductor as a shared space to work with him. And um, ultimately the Eventually, the project was reframed to exclude the chemical process, the chemical functionalisation process, um, completely. So, for me, the, these changing relations with chemistry and engineering just really go to highlight the fragility of shared spaces and um, the difficulty of establishing, establishing them, even between disciplines that have a lot in common to start off with. So you can imagine that when you're trying to build shared spaces between across sort of larger epistemological divides, like when you're, for instance, a qualitative researcher trying to work with nano engineers, then it can, it's a lot more challenging. Um, yeah, so needless to say, at the beginning of the project, there was very little common ground between me and the engineers. Um, and the rest of the team, I guess. We're just coming from such different perspectives that actually even sometimes having quite a simple conversation could be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, so initially I attempted to bridge this divide by bringing a socio-technical understanding of innovation into the project through it by introducing some sociological literature, which I hoped would illustrate that the success or failure of technologies is down to much more than just their technical capabilities. Um, but that <laughs> didn't go down that well. Um, I think 
The rest of the team just found it very difficult to relate to what I was talking about because for them, I was talking about different technologies from what they were making and from their perspective, they were making something that was going to be a lot better than the ones that I was talking about. So it wouldn't be subject to all these challenges and, and, um, and difficulties because it was just going to be so good that people are going to use it anyway. So, um, so rather than bridging this divide between us, I think um, our discussions just sort of highlighted our different perspectives and um, made us argue a bit, really. Um, but the nature, so the nature of the collaboration did make a significant change, though. Once I started my field work and I started to um, bring back the, qualitative, the findings from my qualitative research in the field. So, and at the, at the times when we would discuss the qualitative research, it was my own field work that became the centering object rather than the nanotechnology. So this really moved the spotlight from the technical construction of the device to, to the, continue, the construction that continues after it leaves the lab once it gets into, into um, applied settings. And for, um, for the rest of the for the rest of the team, this really, st this really changed the way not only they thought about the field of use, but also how they thought about the device. And it was at this point that they really started to um, engage in my, in my research and, and, so, and see the relevance of it. And this is demonstrated quite nicely, I think, by David and Lisa. So here they're both saying, <laughs> essentially, at the beginning, we didn't really know what you were doing. <laughs> Um, but now we've seen it, we appreciate that it may have some value. So, so this was progress, and I, I was quite proud of these quotes. And I thought, a little step, but it's, um, it's a step. So, but, and by the end of the project, I think all, almost everybody had come to value my research in, in some way. Um, and I say almost, because not everybody did, and Neil in particular continually failed to see the relevance of it as he um, wasn't shy to tell me. Um, but for me, I mean, the, Neil's perspective, but, but it really just goes to highlight the value of shared spaces and how... The sh these, establishing these shared spaces can reframe the project. With Neil, we never engaged in my, in my research at all throughout the project. In fact, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if he even came to one of the meetings where we discussed my research. But in, 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 you know, for him, he was trying to do a really difficult job. The chemistry was all going really wrong, and he was focusing on that and trying to get that to work. And he just saw anything that detracted his attention from that as a hindrance and a waste of time. So, so Neil never saw the reframe and never engaged with my research and, then, and therefore never saw the reframing that it could bring. Um, so it's no surprise, really, that he never saw the relevance. He wasn't a vegetarian either. I know, but that's what I thought. I like <laughs> vegetables. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> but, uh, yeah, so although, so although my project, my research did gain relevance as the project progressed... Um, it was still very difficult to fully utilise the qualitative research in the design of the device because in the main the project was still focused around um, the technical capabilities and developing this um, and uh, developing the technology which for them just followed this linear process. You develop the prototype and then you follow a series of steps and you eventually implement it and it's all very logical. Um, so this meant that even when we discussed my findings from the field and, and there was something that we all agreed would be was a very important consideration, there was, no, there was just no urgency to do anything about it. And actually, it seems we didn't even need to agree, agree on what the implications of that were. So I think, you know, for example, David was, um, you know, he was saying he sees from my findings that there's, um, you know, based on what I've said, he would like to target the device in a particular place, but then he knows that Alex doesn't agree with that and thinks it should go somewhere else. But they're just not, 
the, for them, it's no concern that they've got totally different ideas for this device because, well, you're just developing the prototype. So this is not till much down the line that we need to think, much further down the line that we need to think about where it's going to go. So just deal with that later. Whereas for me, this lack of a cohesive goal for what we wanted to do th with this technology um, was just really difficult because it meant that it, it really limited what you could do with the with the qualitative research other than just say, here are some interesting things. Um, so yeah, so, so that was my experience. Um, and I think, I feel like I might just be complaining a bit about what a difficult project I was involved in, but I think there's some learning to be done from that. Um, so hopefully I've, I've shown, shown you how important the framing of the project is in uh, determining the nature of the collaboration and for me I think there's two real key messages for other qu qualitative researchers that might be considering embarking on this type of project and the first one would be to ensure that the project is committed to addressing a societal problem rather than advancing scientific processes and this is really really important for I think it's important for all disciplines within a team that you have this shared understanding. Um, but I think it's really important for um, qualitative researchers in particular because a societal problem is something that all disciplines can contribute to equally and legitimately. And rather than focusing on technical capabilities or, or technical processes, which really prioritises certain kinds of knowledge over others. And I think when you do have those imbalances in a team, it allows, it allows some in more privileged positions to come and sort of cherry pick the bits of qualitative research that they do want and disregard the bits that they don't want. Um, and in my case, that was quite often, well, we'll get rid of that theory that explains stuff and we'll have a bit of that data, that, but, not, but not all of it, just the bits that really support what we wanted to do anyway. So I think it's really important that for qualitative researchers that you do have that um, shared defined end goal and I think that that is a, a societal problem and I think that should be you know, a condition of um, actually embarking on such a project. Um, and the second thing would, um, is to just note the importance of shared spaces in um, establishing um, so in uh, affecting the framing and, and renegotiating the framing and I think you know, recognising that as a qualitative researcher you may, you, it's quite likely that you're not going to share very much common ground with disciplines outside of the social sciences so you, I think it's just you know, important to be aware of that and to try and, and work to establish those shared spaces very, very quickly as a priority recognising that the objects, subjects and discussions that are going to constitute these shared spaces are, are, will vary by project, by disciplines, and it's going to require a fair bit of trial and error, trial, trial and error to establish. Um, but I think it's really important as well that this is not just about, or what can we do as researchers to make collaborations better. I think there's a, a very important message for funders here, and that's if you if the intention is to fund truly interdisciplinary collaborations that are going to be able to address these societal problems, then it's not enough to just ask projects to tick the social impact box when they're applying. They need, these projects need to be judged on the integration of this th through the duration of the project when it comes to um, refunding and, and evaluation. Um, so there we go, that's my experience. Um, I hope it doesn't sound too negative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware that it might do. <laughs> um, but I do, you know, I, I do really believe in interdisciplinary research and I think there's so, so many great gains you can make from all working together. I just want to, I just want to highlight that we need to make sure that these collaborations are interdisciplinary and not just a bit of a nod towards it.